Hello, my name is Yashwa Bengio, and today I'm going to tell you about deep learning for AI. I got into this field a few decades ago because I was very excited about what may be called an amazing hypothesis, which many people take for granted now, but wasn't quite obvious then, that there would be a few simple principles um, a bit like the laws of physics that would allow us to understand intelligence um, and, um, and, and that uh, because it's just a few principles, it would have to really rely a lot on the notion of learning so that all of the knowledge that we have, uh, instead of being uh, just a result of a huge bag of tricks, uh, would be mostly acquired through learning. So, so that's pretty much what machine learning uh, as, a, as an approach to AI is about. And it's interesting to contrast this with the um, classical AI approach, the rule-based symbolic methods that were dominant in, in the 80s and 90s when, um, when I started doing this kind of research. So in those uh, classical approach, um, uh, the knowledge is provided by human and machines only do inference. In other words, they combine the pieces of known knowledge in order to come up with um, answers to questions. And there's no learning or not much, uh, no adaptation. It's not clear how to handle uncertainty, although progress has been made on that front using graphical models, which intersect in fact a lot with machine learning. Another problem um, is that these approaches hardly make contact with low-level perception and action. And that's something where machine learning has really succeeded to a great extent. Uh, another area where machine learning has really been successful, but that classical AI didn't handle well, is everything that has to do with intuitive knowledge. Things like common sense that we know, but we don't necessarily know how to explain precisely. And that's the kind of thing that um, you can learn with current deep learning, in fact. But it's not clear how to express that in, in a few rules and symbols. So, so machine learning really gave us a path towards coming up with a, a set of uh, general learning principles that would avoid having to program by hand a huge bag of tricks. But um, today, in, in, in the last few years, and I think uh, looking forward, I'll come back to that at the end, there are still a lot of gaps between machine learning and human intelligence. And a lot of them it has to do precisely with what was the strength of the rule-based approaches. Um, in other words, higher level of cognition and reasoning. So this is something that uh, current machine learning is, is attacking as well, but this is an open problem, really. Now, there are a lot of approaches within machine learning, and today I'll talk about the neural net approach, which I've been involved with. So it's, it's inspired by brain, by neuroscience, and by cognitive science. And it sees computation as emerging from the synergy of a large number of simple adaptive computational units. There is a focus on the notion of distributed representations, which I will elaborate on. But for example, words, um, which are symbols, are not represented by a symbol. They're represented by a pattern of activation, by a vector or a, a word representation. This is something that, um, uh, especially in uh, my work on uh, language modeling that I'll touch upon, um, has been very important for the success of deep learning. And uh, more generally, we see the conceptual ingredients for uh, how a system can become intelligent um, in the neural net approach as arising from combining three ingredients, an objective function or reward function, a learning rule or an approximate optimizer that tries to make the system uh, maximize uh, the objective, and a um, initial architecture or parameterization of the set of functions that we want to search over. 
and all of that um, you know gives rise to the so-called end-to-end uh, learning approach where all of the pieces of the network are adapting together to help each other achieve that objective. Now, machine learning uh, theory has a lot of important concepts, and I will just tell you about uh, maybe what I view as those uh, most salient. And the most important concept in machine learning is that of generalization. You have to distinguish it from learning by heart. Learning by heart is really easy for computers. You can just store the data in memory or in files. But actually, learning by heart, strangely enough, is difficult for humans. What is easy for humans and not so easy for computers is to generalize to new cases. So that's the challenge. And um, you can't do it unless you make some kind of assumptions about the data. It doesn't have to be an explicit assumption. So for example, the structure of the neural net uh, embodies that kind of assumption. In a lot of machine learning theory, we express that assumption as the, a, a form of smoothness prior, a smoothness assumption. Uh, we say that the function we want to learn is smooth, meaning that for two nearby inputs, x and x prime, the output of the function should also be nearby. Another important concept from uh, machine learning theory is capacity. That's the number of arbitrary examples that a learner could always learn by heart. It's like, how many examples can I stuff in your bag? Now, you can control capacity by having a small net versus a large net, for example. And um, there's a really important quantity that varies with capacity, and that's called the generalization gap. That's the difference between the performance you measure on your training data and the performance you measure on your test data. And that gap um, can increase or decrease as you increase capacity. When you have too high capacity, you are in the overfitting regime. Um, and the generalization gap will increase as you increase capacity. When you have too little capacity, your network is too small, um, you're underfitting, and the generalization gap will decrease as you increase capacity. Now, how do we manage to generalize? It seems that the, there is this uh, barrier uh, called the curse of dimensionality that makes it harder and harder if we're trying to generalize in higher dimensions. And to illustrate that, consider first uh, learning in a one-dimensional space, uh, and, and let's make, re make it really easy by breaking down that space, that real line, into 10 bins, and then collecting data for each of the bins, maybe counting how many fall in each bin or what's the average uh, output value that you observe uh, for that bin. Uh, and, you know, quickly enough, you will have data for all the bins, and um, there will be enough in each bin to have reliable statistics about what the answer should be. But now consider two dimensions. Um, so, so now maybe um, instead of having 10 bins, you have 10 by 10 for 100 bins you might end up with some empty bins, like no data falls there, but maybe not that many. If you go to three dimensions, that's 10 by 10 by 10, you've got a thousand bins, um, it gets more tricky now. Um, it's, you're more likely to find empty bins. And if you go to even higher dimensions and think about an image of a thousand by a, a thousand pixels, that's like a million pixels, um, in fact, the vast, exponentially vast majority of the bins will be empty. There will be no data. Now, you can bleed a bit of information from one bin to its neighbors. Unfortunately, uh, for a geometric reason, it doesn't really work well, and it's not sufficient to address the problem. And so you need other assumptions to be able to generalize, besides assuming that the function is smooth. And in, in deep learning, and, and uh, that's probably one of the its greatest strength, we exploit different forms of compositionality to get better generalization. Compositionality is actually easiest to understand by thinking about how we can compose words in language to obtain different meanings. Um, and of course, the number of ways that we can compose words 
uh, words we know in novel ways, uh, combined in novel ways, is, is exponentially large. Um, so that's very powerful. We can generalize to bins, sentences, that we've never seen before in a meaningful way. In neural nets, um, we have two, especially deep nets, we have um, two ways of getting that kind of compositionality or similar kind of compositionality. Um, at each level, you can have a distributed representation, that means a pattern of activations. And um, you can generalize from the patterns you've seen to patterns you've not seen, so long as for each feature, you, you see enough data. And then you can compose different layers if you have a deep network. So that's really the power of uh, deep nets, that you have this composition of features, uh, you have a hierarchy of features. And you also get an exponential advantage from there. Now, the kind that we find in language actually is something that we are trying to put in neural nets these days. And um, that's what I call a system two deep learning. And, and that's something that's ongoing in the research. So in all of these cases, um, really deep learning is characterized by the notion of representation, that we're learning an internal representation that was not given uh, ahead of time. That's, that's really the, the hallmark of, of deep learning. And to understand better why it could be exponentially advantageous, think about um, a convolutional net, which is a special kind of neural net that, that is for images. Um, and uh, you know, it takes an image's input and it outputs some categories, uh, maybe different scenes or, or whatever. But in order to produce its answers, it um, somehow discovers near the, you know, one of the top hidden layers, um, a set of features. So individual units specialize on a task. In fact, we found in experiments that there is such a specialization and that you can uh, describe um, uh, verbally what, what those units um, learn. Um, so imagine one of the uh, units learn the feature that a person wears glasses, another one learns that a person is a female or not, another one learns that the person is a child or not. So you can imagine that in the data there may be some combinations of these features, but it's very unlikely you've seen all of the combination that you had. Uh, you know, uh, 1,000 features, and you, you would need like two to the 1,000 examples. That, that's not plausible. But these things work, and they work because you don't need to see all the combinations of features. You can think of it more like you're learning each feature, uh, the meaning of each feature. And once you understand the meaning of each feature, you can combine, combine them, for example, with a linear classifier. So if you have n features, and each of them needs on the order of k, degrees of freedom to be learned, then you need only on the order of n times k uh, degrees of freedom or on the order of n times k examples to, to learn that. So, so this parallel composition of features really can give you an exponential advantage. And we have mathematical results that, that tell us uh, that story in, in different words. Um, and that should be contrasted with uh, more classical non-parametric statistical methods that would require, just like in the cursive dimensionality example, tiling the space with all of the exponential number of configurations, and you would need that exponential number of examples. Now, let's go to the um, uh, sort of hierarchy of features. Uh, this is something uh, you can get a lot of inspiration by looking at how humans understand the world and how engineers build solutions to problems. Um, if you consider image recognition, you have low-level features, you have pixels, you have low-level features, you have motifs, parts, objects, and so on. And you can you can see similar things in text and speech and so on. So so there's there's a natural natural at least in in the minds of humans way to grasp the world in, in this kind of uh, multi-level hierarchy of features. And then that's been a big inspiration for, for deep learning, of course. Now, as you go higher up in the hierarchy, you're hoping that um, you end up with more and more abstract features. And what does it mean that it's abstract? Well, um, that it allows you to describe what is going on in a very general way that, that applies to many settings. 
And you can even think of the highest level of representation uh, as, well, ideally, um, separating or disentangling, as I, I quoted this uh, uh, a few decades ago, disentangling the explanatory factors of variation. And if you can do that, then it becomes much easier to generalize and transfer to new tasks because uh, new tasks or new settings correspond to typically just um, combining a few of these variables. Um, and so that's gonna be easy to learn from very little data. So a lot of the recent work is about uh, that notion of learning representations that separate those factors of variation, but, but going even further than that and disentangling not just those, those variables, those factors, but the way that they're related to each other, which you can uh, maybe think of as um, the causal structure, the set of causal mechanisms which relate them at the top level. A nice property of neural nets that was uncovered very early on is their ability to approximate anything. If you have a big enough neural net, basically you can approximate any function with some given precision. If you want to approximate with more precision, you make the network bigger, as in wider. That's great. And in fact, a single hidden layer is sufficient. That doesn't mean that's going to be the one that generalizes the best. In fact, a lot of our recent experience and even theory suggests that you want a network that's deep enough. And having that um, universal approximation property uh, is not sufficient because it doesn't guarantee that it's going to be easy to train that neural net to find those weights. I mean, the theory only says that there exists a set of weights that performs the job. Um, also, it doesn't guarantee that you will generalize, that you'll get good generalization uh, outside of the training set. So uh, you know, it's a piece of the theory, but it's uh, clearly insufficient. So how do we train those neural nets? Well, uh, it turns out that of the many, many different optimization methods that exist, one of the simplest way um, is uh, stochastic gradient descent and has worked incredibly well for deep learning. So gradient descent just says change the parameters in the direction that reduces the uh, loss, the error, uh, the most. And that's the derivative of the loss with respect to the parameters. And uh, when um, it's done in a computer, it's fairly easy to compute those derivatives. In the brain, it's less obvious. Um, and, and, um, and then the stochastic part is because the true gradient is over all the examples. Um, but of course, you don't want to wait and see all the examples before you modify your parameters. Uh, you don't wait the end of your life before you change, right? You change every day. So stochastic gradient descent is a kind of noisy version of gradient descent where you only look at a few examples uh, before you modify the parameters. And um, the, the reason why this gradient is so simple and so uh, useful is that it's if you're going to make a small change to the parameters, it's the best change to make in the sense of uh, you know, going down the loss or, or up the objective the fastest possible. Let me go back to the notion of distributed representation. So at NURBS 2000, my collaborators and I presented this uh, neural language model. Um, it was extended in uh, GMLR in 2003. And what it was really uh, was a simple extension of the standard uh, multi-layer neural net, where in the first layer, instead of having a fully connected uh, thing, um, we consider the sequence of symbols as input, a uh, sequence of words, and associate with each word a um, learned word vector. So each word in the vocabulary has a, a different representation. And we take these word vectors, concatenate them, and stick them into a normal neural net. So it's just like the first layer has these shared weights. Uh, if, you can, if you represent each word by a one-hot vector, that's a vector with all zeros except the one, um, it, it, we just have this um, kind of local uh, connectivity, like in a convolutional net, with shared weights. And that's it. Um, another challenge was the output. We have 
tens or hundreds of thousands of words in the vocabulary. We want to predict, say, uh, the next word in the sentence or a word in the middle. Uh, we need to normalize the output so they sum to one, and that's the softmax, and it creates a bit of uh, computational challenge, but today this is handled quite nicely with GPUs. And we can look at those word vectors. Um, and if you zoom in, if you if you reduce dimensionality and project them to 2D, and then you zoom in, you see that words that are semantically similar to each other end up close to each other in the learned vector space. Um, and um, yeah, you can spend a lot of time uh, studying this. That's quite exciting. Um, you can do uh, many other tricks with neural net architectures that that are quite useful and quite exciting, like. You can handle multiple tasks and use the same representation across all the tasks. And uh, now uh, the gradients from all the tasks are pushing the representation in a way that's uh, good for all the tasks. And that ends up uh, often being a, a better representation. Um, you can also uh, turn these neural nets upside down and instead of uh, classifying or predicting some uh, label given an input, they can sample uh, an input given um, uh, some conditions. So uh, one of the approaches for doing that is something we introduced in 2014 called GANs, Generative Adversarial Networks. Uh, it's one of the uh, few methods that are really um, working well and very popular. Uh, another worth mentioning is the variational autoencoder that came out at about the same time. And one interesting aspect of these GANs is that instead of having a single network, which you could call the generator that produces say, images given an input noise vector and potentially some, some um, conditions, um, there's also another network, uh, a discriminator that is a normal classifier. But what it does is it's trained to distinguish between the real images and those generated by the generator. And, um, and then you can take the signal uh, coming from the discriminator to train the generator to fool the discriminator. Um, and uh, the progress that's been made with these kinds of generative models has been amazing in the last few years. So you can see the progression from 2014 to 2018. Um, modern ones are you know, so amazingly good that it's hard to say that it's uh, machine generated. And as I said, you can condition those generators on um, uh, relevant information, like you can map a sequence, uh, like a sentence to an image. Another uh, really um, interesting um, architectural advance with deep learning is the introduction of attention. Attention had been studied earlier, but uh, it really took off with a particular form of attention mechanisms we introduced in my group in 2014. Um, for the purpose of machine translation. So um, you want to go, say, from um, an English sentence, uh, like economic growth has slowed down in recent years, to a French sentence, la croissance économique s'est ralentie ces dernières années. And um, you could use a recurrent net, say, to generate the output sentence. But when you're producing the next word, say, economic, um, it would really help if instead of uh, looking at the whole input sequence um, uh, as a big uh, uh, object, uh, you could focus your attention on the right word. In this case, we know it's the first word of the, of the English sentence, economic. Um, and so that's what attention allows you to do. Um, and you can have... Um, uh, attention focused on one thing, or you can have it focused on several things by having what's called multi-head attention. So you have just several attention mechanisms and each of them produces um, a, a kind of selection, a soft selection from, from the input. Uh, and then these soft selections can be concatenated as input for the next computation. Um, and then when you uh, stage uh, these uh, self-attention mechanisms one on top of the other, you essentially get Transformers and transformers have been amazingly successful. Um, they, um, they 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 allow you to um, obtain the current state of the art in natural language processing, language modeling, translation, and so on. Um, so at the heart of this, well, we have 
uh, is a, a gating mechanism. So something that multiplies the weights uh, based on some context. That's uh, what the way we think about this. Uh, so to potentially um, put all the importance on one element in the input and, and kind of ignore the others. Um, so uh, what's exciting is that it's changing the picture of what a neural net means. Whereas traditionally we think of neural nets as operating on vectors, attention is a kind of internal action uh, can be learned like an internal policy that decides what computation to do and what to compute over. And, and thanks to this, um, you can now think of the input instead of a vector, um, rather as a set, an unordered set, because the same weights can be applied on all the elements. Um, it's, just, it's the attention really that decides on the weights on the fly. Um, and of course, a set is a very general, um, very general data structure. Uh, you can you can um, represent graphs as well. So graph neural nets are another uh, architectural advance that's very closely related to transformers and attention. Now, looking forward, um, there's something important that I mentioned uh, a little bit at the beginning, missing from current machine learning. And that's generalization beyond the training distribution. That is different from generalization beyond the training data. That's the normal kind of generalization. Uh, you might have infinite amount of training data from the same training distribution. So for example, imagine you have a lot of data from one country, like the United States, and you'd like your system to generalize in a, to a different country, say in Europe. Well, it turns out that when you train even with huge amounts of data from the first country, and you try to apply the system on, in the other setting in, in uh, Europe, uh, it doesn't work as well. There's a, 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 a loss in performance. And, and, and of course, theory says, well, of course, it's a different distribution. Why would you even expect that it works? So you need some kind of assumptions to deal with that. And, um, and people are starting to redefine learning theory to uh, handle this notion of out of distribution generalization. And um, the path that I and others have chosen is to look at how humans do it, because humans do an incredible job at generalizing in new settings. And what's exciting is that when they do that, they use a different form of computation in their brain. Uh, they use system to recognition. So whereas uh, when they're behaving in their habitual way, they use system one cognition, which is intuitive, fast, unconscious, so you, you don't have access to the computations that are being performed. Uh, when they attend something new and uh, maybe uh, you know requires their attention, um, they, um, they, 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 uh, they use this uh, more sequential form of computation uh, that's conscious, so you kind of can explain to others what you're doing and why. And we'd like to extend deep learning in that direction. Um, to finish, I want to tell you about um, uh, some some uh, clues, uh, some cues about um, how to run machine learning experiments, um, because you need to get your hands dirty to really understand what you're doing and become an expert um, in machine learning requires becoming an expert at running and coding up these experiments. So um, yeah, don't trust your own code. There could be bugs. So try to run other people's code as a baseline. And then um, once you have debugged your code, make sure that it's available to others so they can debug, they can check your code and replicate your experiments. Also, uh, do a lot of comparisons. Uh, compare always against some baseline methods because you know what's, what's the performance number in the absolute? It's hard to interpret it. But if you can compare it, against other methods, ideally against the state of the art, then you get something you can talk about. Um, also, uh, the data on which you're going to apply maybe some, some new algorithm, um, it would be better if you could use some um, existing data sets, some existing benchmarks with published results and ideally published code so you can compare your new method fairly. By opposition to working on the, your own data set and that nobody has tried before, and um, it's harder for reviewers to know 
you know, to be able to make comparisons with previous work. So don't trust negative experimental results, whether yours or other people's. It could be a bug. Um, and so it's important for these negative results to try to find an explanation for them and maybe to run experiments to test the hypothesis uh, that you, you, you embody in those um, explanations. So in general, think of the experiments not just as something to improve a benchmark and, 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 and you know, beat other people's methods, but rather to help um, understand um, you know, why is this working? What ingredients matter? Uh, what does this teach us that we didn't know already or that we were not sure of? On this, um, thank you very much. And I hope you enjoy uh, uh, the rest of the neural match sessions.